Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, good evening. It's great to be here Friday evening. Well, it's evening in uh, Europe. I don't know if you are calling in from US or Australia. It's obviously a different uh, time. If you be uh, so kind and put in your comments, both people from LinkedIn and uh, Facebook, that you can see me and hear me properly, that would be very helpful. So if you can put in the comments uh, that you can see me and hear me, that would be very helpful. I can see uh, Michael from, from Finland. Uh, Miko, uh, good to have you here. Uh, greetings from Czech to Finland. Radek Zebi, hi Honza. Yeah, I, okay, perfect. Lucia Lacino, greetings from Prague. Uh, excellent. Roman Svoboda, hello. Yeah, hello, hello. All good. Uh, Michal Brabec, Jan Panský is mainly from Czech. Uh, Martin Popelka, Michal Fiala, Bousla Sauer. Uh, Roman Vejraška, good to have you guys here all. František Hruška, Tony uh, from Luxembourg. Uh, hi, Tony. Tony Rodriguez. Uh, LinkedIn News. Konekat, uh, very good. Filip Troníček, Brák. Michal Molek, Martin Popelka, Ladislav Dobes, uh, Pavel Sajl, Roman Frankovič, Rostislav Zajíček, Lucie Vinecká. Uh, excellent. OK, guys. So uh, uh, let's start. If uh, there's somebody from Facebook, if you can put there that you can. Hi, uh, Maxim de Sousa. Hi, Maxim. Uh, good to have you here. Uh, greetings to Paris. Uh, Josef Burian, Wroclaw, uh, Poland. If there is somebody, ah, there is Anna Hromatkova from uh, from uh, YouTube, so it, it's good. Okay, guys, uh, so uh, the theme today is skills for 21st century. So I'll make a couple of points, and then obviously we will open it for the for the Q and A. So first thing, as a you know technology guy or former technology guy, uh, what I would like to point out that we are living in a very different world comparing to 50 years ago, 100 years ago, and etc. For example, my uh, grandfather he was born in 1910, okay, which is like 110 years ago. His brain for you know a uh, whole life process so much information as my brain needs to process in one week so there's a huge pressure on us and there's an exponential growth of information data but also stress uh basically and it's doubling every second year why is that there's something in technology which we call moore law Gordon Moore was the guy who founded Intel in the uh, 60s. And in 1965, he basically defined so-called uh, Moore law. I, I would say it's rather rule. It's not necessarily the law. But anyway, the Moore law says basically that every 18 to 24 months, you will double capacity of transistors on the chip which means that we are doubling computing power around the world every second year, more or less, okay? And this is unprecedented. You know, this, this has never been in the human history. All progress was happening, you know, step by step in the granular way. Today, it's all exponential. Funny enough, this technology is not changing necessarily what is done around the world, but it's very significantly changing how things are done. And that's why the, the demand of a different, you know, type of the skills will be really very, you know, high in this century. So the first question is, you know, uh, how uh, you will, whatever you do today, what will not change dramatically, but how will change very dramatically? If I, I'll give you one example, guys. If you take very traditional, very traditional industry, and this is car industry, okay, 50, even 30 years ago, it was still pretty much car industry. Today, car industry is no more the car industry only. This is software industry. They just did not realize fully. If you take new Mercedes, 
60% of the budget for that new car is software. So you may say Daimler is software company. It's competing with Google, Microsoft, and the others. Funny enough, if you follow those, you know, car companies, they are now acquiring, you know, startups or very promising companies from the IT industry to make sure that they can integrate the best stuff, you know, in, in that. So the first question is, whatever you do, what will not change significantly? How will change significantly? And that will require a different set of the skills. Okay, I can almost guarantee you in five to ten years, if you take like classical, if you are today classical accountant, I have nothing against accountant, but what I know about software which is developed right now, accountant profession as such, unless you will add some value, okay, accountant profession as such will disappear. Okay, there'll be a, another, you know, professions which will disappear. Obviously, you can get, you know, retrain and do something else, but this is it, you know. So that's that's point number one. So technology is playing disruptive role. Technology is changing your industries, but yeah, like the technologically. But then there is another phenomena which was not there with the previous kind of the, you know, paradigm shifts or technology shifts or whatever. And this is something I call basically uh, uh, generational disruption, or if you if you will, uh, you know, disruptive generation. This is for the first time in human history when the young generation understands and uses technology in much better way than the current generation. And and again, you know, right. Uh, we, we should be ready for that. That will have, in my view, three big impacts. Number one, this generation, the young generation, will be sooner in decision-making positions than my generation, baby boomers, okay? That's number one. Number two, they have already, even the kids, like 11 years old kids, if, if the family is buying new car, 40% of the decision-making process is in the hands of the kids below 11 years old. So, they basically, in, they are influencing consumer behavior in the families, okay? And number three, this generation is much more on experience as opposed on ownership. That's why we have like, you know, I don't know, Bolt or Uber, you know, and Airbnb and stuff like that, okay? So they, they, they would rather travel like four months and maybe work for another, you know, eight uh, months, if, if, if you will. This is the new... Uh, type of the of the generation. So, what I wanted to say in the first point, there there is an exponential growth of the technology, but also there will be exponential demand on your skills. And the key for this century is to learn. Number one, okay, and learn because there will be a lot of things which will you will do differently and relearn. So learn, and learn, and relearn. So far, people were only learning. Very rarely they would say, oh, this is no more valid. And it will be because of the technology. So unlearn will be also important. And relearn, you know, right? Like, like to upgrade uh, your skills. Now, let, let me talk a bit uh, kind of what we know, how people are learning in general, how you are acquiring the skills since, you know, basically childhood, uh, right? And what is the best way and what is the reality, okay? When we are born, we basically got like 100 billion brain cells. And those brain cells are connected through so-called synaptical connections, uh, uh, right? Synaptical circles, if you will. And those circles are connected very fast. So we, we all like 50% of the synaptical connections are happening between your, you know, when you are, well, basically between the third trimester of pregnancy of your mom and the third year, when you are three years old, 50%, okay? 75% up to the 10 years old. So the kids are learning very fast because they are very curious and they are creative and they are very open for the learning. And in your brain, there's a lot of space for the new you know, connections. That's why kids are learning so fast. And kids are also learning in so-called flow. Flow are moments, basically, when you are at your best, when you are using your talents in the best way, even though it's tough. Imagine the, your child is building huge, you know, uh, construction from Lego, okay? And obviously, it's it's a very tough, you know, construction. 
but your child doesn't care about the size of that construction, whatever was built in the past or should be built in the future. Your child is taking another cubicle and putting in the right place. And that's how, you know, those synapses are connected, right? Because the, the kids are not, you know, afraid of trying new stuff and so on, okay? And uh, my uh, dear friend, uh, Bruce Lipton, who wrote the book, uh, biology of belief about basically, uh, you know, epigenetics. Uh, he is saying that up to the six years old, we are about 80% of the time, we are like in hypnosis, right? Basically, your brain goes on alpha frequency, which is 8 to 12 hertz, which means that you are learning very fast. Because if you are in the flow, that's the general statement. If people are in the flow, in the, in the best flow are the moments when you are using your talents at, at the best, even though it's very tough. So we are 500% more productive, number one. For learning, which is important for the skills, you are 450% learning faster and you are 400% more creative. This is not my numbers. This is the study done by McKinsey, basically. So up to the six years old, we are really learning very fast. This is why, according to NASA study, 98% uh, of the kids, if they are six years old, they are showing very high creativity, 98%. When, you know, those students are studying and then they are finishing universities, let's say they are like 50, 25 years old, only 2% of those people leaving universities are having high creativity. Why is that? Because unfortunately, you know, the reality, well, there's a lot of opportunities with the with the brain because what we, thanks to the, uh, you know, computing power, we figured out that our brain, that neuroplasticity, the ability to basically, you know, restructure your, your uh, uh, synaptical connections can be changed during the whole life. When I was in the, well, at the university, they taught us that once you are like 30 years old, your brain is like dying more or less. It's not true. Your brain is doing very fast job up to the 25 years old. It, it's kind of the very fast. And then there is something called adult neuroplasticity afterwards, but it's still happening. Those synapses are still happening. Neuroplasticity, guys, is basically ability of your brain to change those synapses based on your own behavior, how you think, the environment you live, what you do, and stuff like that. Which means that even if you are 30 years old, 40 years old, 50 years old, almost 60 years old like me, you can still rewire your brain because of the neuroplasticity. Which is a that's a uh, th this is a this is a great uh, uh, you know news, right? So neuroplasticity is you know fantastic, and those kids you know when up to the six years old. They are using the power of the neuroplasticity in the best way. Then when they go to the school, unfortunately, the school is teaching everything in the boxes. This is the math. This is the, you know, I don't know, uh, uh, physical exercise. This is the uh, chemistry, whatever. So we are learning in the boxes. That's not good. But we, you can learn in the boxes. But what do you need to do? You need to tie those boxes together. Why Leonardo da Vinci was genius? Because he was able to put, you know, different boxes together, right? And that's what is happening in the real practice. Bill Gates has never asked me, like, Jan, did you learn this in, you know, uh, chemistry or did you learn this in math or whatever? No, he wanted me to solve that issue, okay? Uh, this is it. And unfortunately, those kids are learning everything. It's like memorizing the stuff. And with all respect to the schools, you know, schools, uh, there are two, in my view, there are two institutions which did not change last 300 years. It's schools and cemetery. I'm not saying that the schools are cemetery because I, I said it's uh, time ago in uh, uh, some New York Times interview and people went after me. I'm not saying that the schools are cemetery. I'm saying that schools did not change 300 years. In the Central Europe, the system was, because of the Maria Therese, was basically army system kind of the memorizing and the discipline. In anglo saxon countries, it's usually a factory system, kind of, the you know, according to the factory. And it's obviously not good because we live in the 24th century. So I think the opportunities, how you can learn in a very fast and very modern way are very high. 
but the schooling is still here. And I tell you what is wrong with that system. Because when you when it's all based on memorizing in the boxes learning, then if the kids are learning, you you basically learn, you put it in the short-term memory, you basically may get good rating, but because only chemical change is happening in your brain, everything is gone. I, I give you one example. Take history. You can teach history facts by facts. Okay, those are the dates of the battles, and you should learn it. Or you can learn history as the story. This is the story of the history, and put those dates, you know, into that story. Then basically, because in your brain, that's about all about neuroplasticity. In your brain, neuroscientists are saying neurons which fire together, wire together, which means, for example, let's say I'll teach you a battle by the Waterloo, okay? So all neurons where you have some, you know, information about it, like who was there, what were the weapons, the date, and so on, those neurons will get uh, 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 basically connected together. And then, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, what happened is basically structural change in your brain. It's not chemical change, it's the structure change, okay? Because the brain is not working linear, like you are going like step by step and learn, you know, by, by, uh, by heart. No, your brain works in associative manner. That's how brain basically works. Putting, you know, the new stuff together, connecting the new stuff together. Those of you who are familiar, Tony Buzan, unfortunately, who passed away, he created so-called brain maps. Brain maps is basically based on the concept of the neuroplasticity and stuff like that, which means basically that, that you know, story learning, like learning in the, you know, broader context is the best learning. And uh, on the other hand, story was the way how we were, you know, handing over information for many, many centuries. Computers are like uh, 50 years, uh, good computers, 50 years probably, 500 years, there is a, you know, uh, we, we can, you know, print. Uh, before that, it's all, you know, story. That's why story is still playing because this is the over-communicated world. They, I mean, the young generation, I'm telling about the young generation, I like them very much, the young generation, but I'm saying you are over-informed generation, over-informed, but under-focused generation. Okay, but on the other hand, if you wanted to get the focus of those people and you put their story, you will get it because once you are telling them something they can have emotional connection to, they will listen to you. Okay, so that, that's basically uh, that's basically what I think we should uh, uh, we should do. We should do much more. Learning will be much more global today. You have pretty much everything what people know. It's on internet. It's, you know, on YouTube, okay? I think there'll be much more teamwork, you know, right? Today, if the kids are working together, right, uh, they'll get, like, all, you know, ratings down because the teachers are saying you are cheating. If the people were working nicely together in Microsoft, they're getting a good bonus from me because it was a, it was a good team. And last but not least, what is the future of the learning and lifelong learning for the whole life, both in the schools and but also at the workplaces? It will be individually based, based on the talents on that particular person. Imagine the situation when you pretty much know who you are, what are your talents, and basically this is what you need to learn. You need to learn it, but you can learn it in a different ways. Depends because if you are like if your main talent is okay, I'm analytical. Then probably you guys who are analytical, you will go and you build step by step from small pieces the huge reality. I'm more strategic than analytical. So I do and I look from the helicopter and I go, you know, down. And both of us will learn well if we will use our own talents. And I think that that's the future of learning to figure out who you are so you can learn through different learning styles, right? Unfortunately, we still think that all people and all, you know, pupils and all, you know, students are uh, pretty much the same. And it's not true at all. The other thing, which, which I believe it's very important, if you will ask me, Jan, what, what are the skills for the 21st century? I think 
you would for this century you would need to know very well your craft okay for example i spent my career in sales and marketing and i think i know pretty much uh, everything what, what i can but um, i can still learn so you would need to learn you know uh, your craft and have the ability to learn relearn unlearn you know stuff like that that's point number one and point number two which i think it's mainly missing you will need much more to understand who you are to be able to understand our other people and that's the that's the problem in the schools and in the workplaces that we are teaching people what is around them but we are not necessarily teaching them what is inside them okay what well, emotional intelligence if you will uh daniel goldman who uh, i'm now the coach at the uh, uh, harvard coaching institute and he's you know giving lessons there and he wrote a book 25 years ago emotional intelligence and in that book daniel was saying that success whatever you do success is 20 percent iq traditional intelligence that's what is taught in the schools and 80 percent you know eq today he's saying it's only seven percent iq and 93 percent eq and that eq is still not taught in the schools what kind of the emotions you have what are the emotions of the other people? How you can you know work uh, together and and stuff like that. So that's I think what what is necessary for this century. You need to know your craft, whatever your craft is. Whether you know you are like general manager, marketer, sales manager. You are maybe scientist or you are. I have a, a, a lot of athletes, as you probably know. You need to know that, but then you need to know also who you are to understand other people because emotions uh, were always important but will be even more important in the future tell you why because technology guys technology will mainly replace those jobs which are based on the logic technology if you take whatever this device or device we are communicating through it's not it, it's called this is called smartphone it's not smartphone it's stupid phone because on the philosophical level phone or computer can distinguish zero and one in a very fast way this is it all smartness in that device is coming from here from the human brains that's all smartness those devices are having but logic wise this device i mean it's already like 20 years ago since you know computers were beating best chess players okay if it if it's based if those tasks are based on the logic a lot of those logical based tasks will be replaced by technology whatever have to do with the emotions it will be very tough for those computers and phones or whatever to replace human beings if you i'm coaching also people from the artificial intelligence if, I, I i can imagine that you may ask the question what about the artificial intelligence okay true true on the other hand uh you know those devices they still don't have emotional intelligence they can learn but it's mainly you know uh, logical learning that's why the emotional intelligence is really really important and last point because i i think a lot of you there are having some people responsibility are leaders so i, I will uh, tackle you know what i think it are the kind of the leadership skills for the 21st century okay just a sec And it has to do again with your craft, but also with emotions. I think the CEO, which means in English, chief executing officer or chief executive officer, uh, that will stay the same. You will still need to be that guy who need to deliver, you know, your PNL balance sheet, market share, whatever balance scorecard for sure. But the CEO for the century stands also for the chief enthusiasm officer. And I will explain you what I mean, guys, by enthusiasm, okay? By enthusiasm, I mean two things. The leaders, the best leaders of the 21st century, they need to have energy, A, and they need to uh, basically be able to inspire people. Explain you why. What do you need to do? Basically, the best leaders, they understand who they are, they understand what they want to do, and they do the decisions, so they use who they are, to achieve what they want and that's the same with with their people okay so you need to figure out what is the best in your people if you are the good leader so what is, how you can how you can put everybody in the flow in your organization how to put your organization in organizational flow and that's about inspiration 
In, in spirit, it's something different from motivation. Motivation is about bonus, money, car, whatever. In spirit means that your people will have a heart behind what your company or you guys are you know, doing, basically. In spirit means in spirit, in your soul, basically. And you can inspire other people through the vision. That's from the history. What is the vision? Vision is the picture of the world. Have you read the book Emotional? Absolutely. I, I did. That's just <laughs> Daniel is teaching us at, at the Harvard, you know, I'm a fellow at the Harvard Coaching Institute. Absolutely. It's uh there are other there is another guy's book if you wanted to read what uh just a second. What he basically applied for the leadership, the new new leaders, it's also a good book from Daniel. This is a good book. The new uh, leaders transforming the art of leadership into the science of uh, uh, into the science of results. Okay, I, I give you also another good you know book from Gallup on kind of the 21st century leadership in, in a moment. Okay, so you inspire by the vision. What is the vision? Vision is the picture of the world in this case of your organization or the market, basically, uh, which does not exist yet, but you believe in that vision. And if you have energy, you need to have energy and communication skills, then people will start to believe in what you believe, and then you will move the crowd, you know, basically. And you, you will start to build really the organization of the 21st uh, century. That's why CEO, chief executive officer, but also chief enthusiasm officer. Enthusiasm means energy and inspiration, if you take energy, inspiration, EI, emotional intelligence. And now uh, the, the book, I wanted to recommend you, unfortunately, it's only in English. It's not uh, in the other languages so far. Uh, it's uh, uh, from uh, uh, Gallup, uh, basically. And it's called, it's a, it's a manager. It's, it's a manager. That's the name of the, of, uh, uh, the book. And my dear friend, uh, Jim Clifton, uh, wrote a book. Who is the CEO of, uh, of Gallup? I helped him to launch it here. Uh, in Europe. And uh, basically, because Gallup, they have a tons of the data from the different organizations. They are really, if you look at the Gallup web page, you can learn a lot what's going on around the world. There's a lot of data available for free. And in this book, they put together all of the data. What they figure out that basically 70%, 70% of uh, the uh, success in all organizations are managers. 70% of the success of all gun organizations are the managers. And basically, there are a couple of points. He talked about this, you know, new generation, new talent. You want to bring in the, into your organization. What uh, does it mean? Okay. He's basically saying that in the past, it was a lot about, you know, salaries, maybe some stock options, some, you know, bonus. This is taken now with this young generation. This is like hygienical, you know, factors. They would like to see what is the meaning, what is the purpose of your organization, and if you are helping to change the world for better. And I can, you know, confirm that I left Microsoft six years ago. It was happening already seven, eight years ago when I was hiring some people in Microsoft. So that's number one. Number two, in the past, it was about I need to be satisfied in the company. Now it's much more I need to be developed. What I can learn, what are the new things I can learn like every day in the company. That's another aspect. In the past, it was more like, okay, I'm your you know, manager, I'm your boss. Now, it's much more, they, they would like to have a much more from that boss becoming, you know, coach, okay? Coaching, asking a lot of questions, you know, uh, helping them to be uh, more curious and stuff like that. When I was still in Microsoft, we used to do performance reviews at the mid-year which was like in the middle of uh, fiscal year and at the end of the fiscal year. Well, obviously, we were doing like one-on-ones every month, but it was more on the business. It was not necessarily on the, uh, you know, development. I was doing a little bit, you know, more as always, but it, 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 I, it was uh, not necessarily done in the whole company. Today, that generation wants to have that because it's an instant generation. They have like instant feedback on all of those devices. So they wanted to have like instant feedback almost like every day. How did I do? Right. So th this is it. And that's something uh, uh, that's something uh, uh, very new. OK, so th there are a couple of couple of things from that book. I can really recommend, you know, uh, this is a this is a good book. 
I obviously try to put a lot of ideas I share today with you in my first book, Positive Leader, because I am probably uh, one of the first kind of the global leaders who think, and now, you know, the history is proving me to be right, that the meaning and happiness is the long-term driver for the success. It's not the other way around. It's not that, you know, like you are successful and then you are happy. No. Even Bill Gates was telling me, hey, I love software so much and Microsoft so much. And the fact that he became the richest person in the world, it was almost like the side effect. Okay. So I, I really believe that once you build emotional connection to what you do and you help to build emotional connection to your people to, so they are really, you know, inspired and they do uh, what they like. This is that, you know, happiness and meaning is long-term driver uh, for the success. And this is the way I think that the, the, there is so many conflicts in the world today and it's all because of the emotions. If we will understand each other better, you know, and everybody, you, you should understand each of us on this call we view world a little bit differently because your brain can process only like 120 bits per second information and around you there's 11 million uh, bits per second of the information so your paradigm is kind of the narrow and you need to understand what is your paradigm to understand other people where we are the same where we can be you know complementary how we can work together and i think if people will be more self-aware, this is what I do now, whether it's in the business or I, you know, coach some top athletes or artists, you know, to basically help to understand who they are in order to understand who they can be. Because unless you understand where you are, where are your starting blocks, you cannot, you know, understand where you can go. Like, it's like uh, Alice in the uh, Wonderland. Okay, guys, so uh, are there some questions already? I think so. Uh, yeah, let me check it. Uh, uh, there is some today we finally watching together with my girlfriend. We need more streaming English. Perfect. Uh, Michal, <laughs> best regards to your girlfriend. I like Finland. As you know, I was working for the Finnish government when Matti Van Hanen was a prime minister 14 years ago. Lucas, would you say that your grandfather was more of a rational decision maker given he had law, lawless to process. On the other hand, we know more about neuroplasticity. Uh, Lucas, I would say it, this is a general statement, guys. I believe that while technologically we are so much ahead of the previous generation, I don't think that our quality of thinking is that much better as, you know, 100 years ago, basically. Because... I think uh, there is a lot of, because of those devices, I was, you know, saying also, <laughs> there is a lot of what I would call uh, mental pollution, okay? Because there is a lot of, there's a lot of good stuff, but there's a lot of good, you know, shit also, right? Which is not necessarily. What I think also, and I, I was doing some in, big interview today, and I said, you know what is interesting? Today, technology-wise, I mean, people should be very proud what we achieve as a society, as a humankind. We are really ahead, right? But then some virus is coming. Mother, mother Nature are sending us some lesson, okay? Some virus is coming, and we are basically locking down the whole world, and we pretty much don't know what to do. And some countries, the way we manage that, it's very chaotic. If you will talk about the leadership, you know, I would I would probably not hire that many leaders to be my direct reports in Microsoft if they would behave the way they behave during the uh, coronavirus decision making wise, you know, right? So uh, to say about that, uh, you are right that the generation 100 years ago, even 50 years ago, we didn't know about neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity is quite new. It's like three years old. Thanks to the neuroplasticity, people also now understand that, you know, genes are genes, but genes are not like your prophecy. The genes are turned on or turned off based on your environment, how you think, and so on. It's called epigenetics, okay? Because our brain, our brain behaves like a big chemistry. If you are in the good shape and you like what you do, you are in the good group of the people, 
a lot of endorphin, dopamine, serotonin, oxytocin is released. And you are also in the good shape biology-wise, okay? You are, your immunity goes up. If you are stressful, you know, right? You are not sleeping enough, not good, you know, team. There is a lot of cortisol release. And then, because each and every gene is having like 3,000 different mutations, and those mutations which are bad for you may turn on because of the, because of the cortisol. Well, now Honza is back on TV. I was a couple of times in the TV. Uh, I said, did you know that your car gets uh, charged via ignition, no battery uh, inside? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm currently working with the company on developing A for careers, guidance for young people. Uh, I think so. I think definitely, Lucas, definitely. I mean, I, I'm a huge fan of artificial intelligence, and it's not... Uh, because Microsoft is quite in quite good shape as as far as the artificial intelligence is, is concerned, you know, right? So um, uh, I think definitely, sure. I I'm a huge fan of artificial intelligence. I think artificial intelligence will not necessarily uh, replace the people, but like developing, you know, teaching, learning, that's fantastic, you know, right? Uh, uh, banking, sure, you know, technology can help a lot. I definitely agree, Patrick. So, uh, learn, relearn, unlearn, and also improving, especially your strength. Absolutely. Because if you think, look, the way, I mean, now I, I think now I probably like 90% of my time I'm giving back to the society, 10% I'm learning, whatever. But there were times when I was like 35 years old and I said, well, I wanted to be successful. And the way to be successful is basically to use what is best in my people. But and that's that was my thinking at that time. This is just the performance. But then I said, well, you know, if the people will really use their strength, if they will be, you know, on their best on, they will be also, you know, happier and they will be tighter connection to the company, tighter connection to the uh, uh, to the to the team, right? And that's how it all started. This idea with uh, you know unlocking uh, human potential. Uh, yeah, that Lucas, you are absolutely right that the schools are uh, not. Um, which which university was it? Uh, ah, I don't know if it's like question on me. I studied Czech Technical University. Today I teach. I'm entrepreneur residence at INSEAD. I teach also some lessons at the Luxembourg Business School at Imperial College here in Europe, and then in the US. You know, I I do like twice not, not not this year but usually twice and i do the tour like east coast or the west coast which means like harvard mit or stanford and a couple of other schools i do also i work with the new york university uh schools teaching thinking seldom they teach sensing uh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, absolutely because there, there are a lot of things teamwork is dream work edward ah good to Good to hear from you, from Switzerland. Emotional intelligence is catching up with intelligence. In my view, uh, it is more important. It is very important because, guys, even today I was doing some interview with the, to the some finance magazine, okay? And I said, even you guys are very rigorous. It's all about the money, success, and so on. But if you take, Lucas, if you take last financial crisis, right? I, I don't mean the, the covid but that 2007-2009, I was basically, uh, I, I got, a friend of mine was doing like the big doctorate at one university on behavioral economy. And he, he basically worked with a couple of universities in Europe. And the conclusion was of that work he did, that, you know, doctoral work was that last uh, crisis was 60% emotion driven, emotion driven and only 40% reality. If you take COVID, COVID for sure, it's a new thing. It's maybe dangerous, but COVID is driven mainly by the fear, by the fear of the people. And obviously it's a huge business for the media. Uh, you know, fear, it's, it's a good article because you can sell it like that because your brain goes five times faster after the negative, you know, news as opposed to the positive news, that's the amygdala and, and pretty much neocortex relationship because amygdala is there forever, neocortex only like 12 to 15,000 years.
Uh, okay, Martin here in uh, Slovakian. Uh, okay, I greet you also. Uh, thank you very much for what you said. Okay, uh, Finsky, Krajanek, <laughs> that's Vika. Uh, there is education system you help to develop the way how to teach the people, and it should be example for the other countries. Hopefully, we'll welcome you here at one day at the university. Yeah, guys, I was in Finland for like for half of the year very often when uh, the Finns got a presidency in EU 2016. And in Finland, uh, it's interesting system. I give you a couple of things. For example, last year, they were, you know, uh, accepting only 600 new stu students for the pedag pedagogical university, 600 new students, and they have 6,000 applications. So there is like one student per 10 application. So there's a huge, they can really choose from the best. If you are a teacher in Finland, it means something. They need to pass so-called, you know, exam for the talent. If you are talented to teach other people, that's the other thing. Then what do you do with the kids on the other side? They take the pyramid of the kids, the best kids, you know, average and kind of the below the average. And here is, here is the thing. And it's about growth, you know, mindset. Because they are telling them, we will help you to move you on your best level. They are not telling them, they are not comparing them, hey, those guys are better. No, we will help to move you on your, you know, uh, best level. And this is it. And that's how they they are basically um, encouraging growth mindset. Because growth mindset is basically being better version of yourself every day, wherever you are, your starting, you know, points. Not everybody will be, you know, scientist, engineer, and, and so on, right? But if, if even if you work like, you know, manually, it's nothing bad. In fact, you know, like in Czech Republic, it's very hard to get somebody who is really skilled manually these days, you know, right? So uh, that's another thing what they do excellently in Finland. And uh, no doubt, the Finnish system, usually if the OECD is doing the PISA measurement, which is like the language, mathematics and science, Finns, Singapore and Shanghai and sometimes Korea are usually the best, you know, systems. They have the best, you know, results, right? This is it. To change, basically what they did in Finland, to change educational system, to do educational reform, it takes 10 years. And you need for that, you need to have pretty much political consensus, okay? So there are, you know, Miko would tell you that they have, for example, in Finland, it's called future committee, okay? I can't imagine to have future committee in Czech or in Slovakia or in other countries in, in Central. I tell you what is the future committee. Future committee is basically think tank from the MPs, from the members of the parliament, usually chaired by the person, by the main person from the opposition. And they are like think tank and they think what Finland will do five, ten years from now, okay? So in majority of the countries, they go like opposition coalition, they go like that, right? That's why, I mean, I would never go to the politics because if you are in the business and Google is having some good idea, you basically go and you license the idea, whatever, from Google and the other way around, okay? And that's the way you move, no, in politics. Even if there's a great idea, that guy is from the different camp. No, 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 it's not good idea. So you're good to the media and you say, no. Uh, in the politics, unfortunately, the, I think democracy is now in the crisis and there is a lot of negative energy in the politics and very often there's an overlap to the society. I'm not talking about only about COVID, but this is even pre kind of the uh, pre-COVID. And uh, and I think it, it, it really takes some thinking and we have a good system. It's really like Scandinavian countries and mainly I know very well Finland where we can go, right? Uh, Jan, which schools are you referring to check its huge uh, generalization? However, I agree with your uh, voice. I, uh, look, I have experience because, guys, I before I was a chairman for Europe for eight years, I was running for three years, uh, basically, public sector for Europe, Middle East, and Africa. And in my job, it was also schools and education in Europe, Middle East, and Africa. And since, even though it's, what, uh, you know, 12 years, it didn't change that much, you know, right? So I, I talk pretty much about almost all schools with the exception of, there's a little bit better, you know, schooling system in Nordic countries, 
Australia is a, is a bit better. And then obviously like private schools, private schools are also good in Czech. Not all schools are bad. I'm not, not saying it. it also depends on the, you know, teachers. I, I, I don't attack teachers or even the Ministry of Education. What I attack is the system which did not change 300 years, which was created by Habsburgs. Okay. And do you think that Habsburgs, they wanted people to be creative or curious? No. <laughs> they want people to listen to them and do the things they wanted them to do. Okay. That, that's, that's basically my criticism. Smartphone is stupid. <laughs> no, it's a, you know what I mean? It's not stupid, but all intelligence of all of those devices is from, you know, banks. Okay. I like the way you're teaching it. <laughs> Have you? Yeah, I did. I did uh, I mention. Yeah. Uh, okay. Just a sec, because. Uh, Michal Brabet, how do you see relevance of inclusivity and equality within teams in terms of people development, learning, and inspiration? Uh, guys, I really believe in uh, diversity in general, okay, but not artificial diversity. Di diversity. I would be very strongly, for example, against quotas, like quotas for the genders makes no sense, whatever EU thinks. I give you what I what I did in Microsoft, right? I know, maybe if we take gender diversity as an example, good example. I know, I mean, your team should reflect pretty much your customers or whatever is your audience, okay? Whether it's like racial diversity, gender diversity, whatever, it, it should be diverse. Diversity is good because people, I sometimes let teams with like 40 different nationalities in my career. People are bringing different, you know, views, right? On the, on the gender diversity, because I worked for many years with the World Economic Forum, I even chaired the Educational Roundtable for EMEA, uh, you, and you can find it, uh, that study on um, uh, the web page of the World Economic Forum. They do every year, it's called gender gap. They measure equal opportunities of the, of the genders, men and women, you know, in education, healthcare, in economy and in the politics, okay? And what they figure out, if they have more women in economy and politics, those countries are more competitive than the countries not having that. Czech Republic, for example, scores very well in education and like healthcare, what you can get from the healthcare. We don't have enough women in economy and we have very few women in politics, right? But if you take like Sweden or Finland, 2006, Mati Van Hane was a uh, prime minister in Finland, okay? And I remember he invited a couple of us as advisors to the government session. There was 12, 2006, ladies and gentlemen, 12 women, eight men on that session. Sweden, similar, okay? Denmark, similar. And those countries, if you take, you know, like that diversity, right? And then, you know, competitiveness, they are more competitive. So there is, obviously, it should be fair, number one, right? The, the, the fair kind of the, uh, uh, choice. But on the other hand, you know, it's clear that if, you know, you are diverse, you are more competitive. So there's economical reason. I don't think that artificial things like we need to have like 50, 50 percent. Uh, yeah, it's ideal, you know, but there's, you know, some way. But I would rather, if I would be like EU or whoever, I, I think, they don't do it anymore. But whoever wants to, you know, move that agenda with gender diversity, I would say there is a good economical reason. And, and that's true. It's just, you know, they need to study the right, you know, uh, materials. Right? So I think definitely diversity, I like it and it's good. It's good for the business and it, it, it's good for you know leadership. Hi, Jan. I'm preparing myself for a personal interview with my boss. And this is definitely <coughs> what I will tell him. <laughs> okay, perfect. <laughs> <clears throat> Tell him that he needs to be chief <laughs> enthusiasm officer. What, with your help, we are going to make Nokia great again. Well, let's see. <laughs> Interestingly, you mentioned, Mika, you, you mentioned Nokia. Nokia, guys, it's a good example because Nokia, if you will go still 15, 16 years ago, 
Nokia was like number one, top on the hill, nobody around, whatever, okay? Then what happened? They did not realize that this device is no more phone. This is computer. Today, 90% of what people are doing is done through those devices because then obviously, you know, Apple came with the iPhone, you know, and, and other guys, and it, it was it. So uh, that that's what, you know, I think Nokia was late to really realize paradigm change. That was a paradigm change. The same happened, by the way, with Microsoft. Because Microsoft, two mistakes we did. One with the search. If we would buy, if we would buy, uh, basically, uh, uh, um, uh, what is the name of the other search engine? It's Google and the other one. Oh, man. Guys, help me. The, there's a, one more, you know, company. They were quite good with the uh, search engine, but I don't remember. Anyway, so the, the, we were we were too late because I, I tell you what was the reason, okay? Yahoo, sorry, I have like I have a blackout because I, I I like talk uh, today the whole day. So Yahoo, Yahoo was available. We could buy it in 2001, and then you know Google would be basically not be Google, right? But we underestimated because we thought that search will be kind of the one feature in Windows, say, okay? And we didn't realize it's a new, it's totally paradigm shift. It's like based different, you know, commercial model. <coughs> Sorry, different business model. That was it. That was a one huge mistake. And in, and I was relatively new in uh, leadership team at that time. So I, I don't feel guilty. Where I feel guilty, it's really mobile technologies because it was clear to us in Europe that it's moving so fast. But unfortunately, Americans, they have like all pagers. And because they have so many fixed lines and everything was fine in the US, they they were quite you know late with that thinking, and we were not able to persuade the part of the leadership team from the US, and that's why uh, we came you know late. Okay, and you know in business it goes like you go imagine right Microsoft 2000 2001 you are on the big boat on the calm ocean it's absolutely calm ocean okay. And you don't see from the deck of that boat, you don't see small ships, Google, Apple, going very fast. You don't see them because you are like on the on, on the deck and everything is fine. And they are faster than you. And this is basically disruptive you know, innovation. This is disruptive technology because once you are such big company, you know, it's a it's hard for you to move the course, basically, because you are on the big boat. We did it, but it was, you know, too late. Right. But Microsoft is still doing very well because of the other scenarios like big data and, you know, cloud and obviously artificial intelligence and so on. But those two mistakes were were done. And I, I feel responsible, at least for the one with the mobile technologies. The lack of the leaders uh, among politicians. Absolutely. Uh, Edward, there is a second thing that is no teaches in the school. Solving conflicts. Conflicts are eating. Edward, I absolutely agree with you. And the way how I look at it, majority of the conflicts are there because of the emotion. So I think if we will help people to understand who they are, then they can understand who is the other person. So they can understand that perhaps the other person is having different view. And then we can, you know, basically lower the number of the conflicts. A lot of conflicts are driven by our ego. Okay. Once you your ego goes down, and ego is not us, it's our fears. But when you understand what are your emotions, what are your fears, what are your doubts, your ego goes uh, down, and then you are like more in the present moment, and you also, uh, you know, judge less, judge yourself and the other, other, other people. Alta Vista, ah, Alta Vista, Tanya, that was before even <laughs> Yahoo Alta Vista. But you are right, you are right. Tanya is, by the way, Tanya is, uh, uh, she was uh, working with me in Microsoft many, many years ago, and now she's doing a great job running uh, Google in Central Europe. So, Tanya Limon, good to have you here. Uh, Dasha, you recall, because or if you are, that, that this is something you are telling, uh, Dasha. I am 17 years old, 100% agree. <laughs> Australia, positive psychology. Hmm? Ah, uh, uh, 
Mr. Miller, could you answer me more time uh, about intrapersonal uh, uh, intelligence? I'll tell you. Uh, the way I view it, I, I'm not saying that it's necessarily, you know, 100% right. Uh, when we are born, okay, we are totally dependent on our parents, then on the people from the kindergarten, school, whatever. So we are dependent. Then we go to the puberty and we are, you know, getting more and more independent, okay? But I think the people who are really like happy and successful, they are interdependent. Which means basically, okay, I'm like strategist, you know, I'm visionary, but I'm not necessarily good in details and I'm not necessarily the best empathic person. So the good, you know, guy for me, kind of the co-owner of my business or maybe co-pilot if I run some business is somebody who is more like analytical person and who is more, uh, you know, empathical, right? And and this is this is what what I would call basically if if you think about it and you know if you understand like yourself okay I am I'm like this is who I am ba basically what, how you can understand it your talents are usually activities which are giving you energy this is really for me like strategy vision communication I can do analytics very well, very well. It's a good job, but it's taking energy. All details are taking energy from me. This is not best usage of my time. We are now writing the new book called, you know, the uh, family as a team with Katka. And it goes like we go like every week. There's a one session and one, you know, evening session. Uh, right. We are putting together a lot of material, but I'm not the guy who would do like all details. I'm talking a lot. And then somebody is sitting that, you know, talking. So this is it. Because if you understand who you are and you understand who you are not, you can build really complementary teams because my strengths are covering your weaknesses and the other way uh, around, right? Uh, this is it. And then, obviously, Libor, if you want to build the whole, like, team based on the strengths, it's basically, under if you are a leader, understand each and every person and how those people can work together. I, I give you an example what I do with the teams recently, for example, with the board of Slovenska Sporitelna, Erste Bank in Slovakia, okay? There are like seven members of the board. So each line was like one person. And then you get like each and every person got like five top talents. From, I'm using Gallup Strengths Finder. And those talents are divided in four groups. If people are like executive talents, which means like you are good on doing executive talent. Then they are influencing talent. You are good influencer. You are good in like kind of getting, you know, new connections and so on. So that this is influencing. Then you have uh, relationship building. This is like more working with the uh, existing customers, building even more relationship. And then there are like strategic talents and, and strengths. Okay. And if you build that table, you see immediately like what is the picture of the whole team? You can do even the percentages. What is, uh, what is your team and how you can work together. And I tell you, what is the, what is the future? You call it the uh, uh, intrapersonal intelligence. I call it, you know, strengths-based teams. It doesn't matter. I think the future is that we will in the future, like let's say there is a project, okay, and you are dividing the tasks of that project. We will not divide in the future those tasks based on what you have on the business card. We will divide or distribute those tasks based on your talents how to because then you can make sure that everybody is doing what he or she likes a eh? and you are getting the best uh, uh, outcome obviously right so that that's kind of the uh i i agree with finsky Krajanek. what can we do to make any change in the education system yeah that, that's uh christina uh, Storko. It's a uh, it's step by step, and again, I think it, I I if I I talk a couple of times before COVID, for example, with the check with Mr. Plaga, he's a smart guy, you know, right? He knows what needs to happen, but he needs to get more political support from the different uh, you know parties. I think th it's about political consensus. It, the issue is not like inclusivity or. The mandatory, you know, exam from math, mathematics or that. those are good, you know, things, right, to discuss. But the major issue is, and nobody is really talking openly. We have a three hundred years old school system, you know, which we are using. Now there was like the, uh, you know, three hundred fifty years since since Comenius, 
John Amos Cominius, you know, uh, died. Everybody was like reading, you know, from the books, but nobody is implementing Cominius, okay? Cominius is school by play, uh, uh, right? School by play, schola ludus in Latin. He's basically saying, if you tell them, they will forget. That's the way we teach kids, okay? If you will involve them, which means involving in all senses and in all those kids, they will understand. And then there's some, and then those, you know, structure changes are happening in your brain. And there is something they call it in English uh, uh, embodied experience, which means that your knowledge is becoming your skill, basically, right? Jan, is there any chance to cooperate with you on developing new learning methods for the, for the children? Uh, look, I I don't think I, I I was in the different you know groups on the Ministry of Education, not only in this country, in majority of the countries. I put it in into the books. What is kind of my view? I don't think I will change my view because this is uh, pretty much like you know solid for 15 years, and I I basically refused. I was asked by some groups, and I re refused to join. Uh, because I think now it's it's not about, you know, uh, like uh, I, I tell you what is, uh, Lucia, I, I will tell you what I think is the uh, educational reform. Comenius and technology. Having Tanya here on the call, you know, she like it. Comenius and technology. And this is it, right? Because Comenius, when Comenius was there in the 17, 16, 30, he was saying school by play. It was very tough to do it. Now you can do it, right? Imagine, imagine the school of the future. If the child, six years old child, obviously on the level of six years old child, he or she will know what kind of are like my main talents, what I really like, you know, right? So you will basically sit with the child. This is what you need to learn from English or Czech language or whatever. This is who you are. These are your talents. Let's talk together how to use who you are to learn best, you know, uh, that specific subject, right? It, it's basically, I mean, when I was running public sector for Microsoft, at, already at 15 years ago, we were saying pupils or the students should be in the center, and it's still not in the center because it's all about like we are, we think that all kids are the same and we are pushing the knowledge in the same way. And, you know, today, if you, if you think, if you take like things like Khan Academy, you can learn really based on your own style. Khan Academy is there since like 2009. It's for, you know, many years. There are a lot of other uh, good things. So I think there is a definitely good start, but it needs to be. My view is that unless there is a political consensus and really school reform is for 10 years, nothing will happen, right? So that's, a. Uh, uh, this is it. Yahoo, yeah, right? Communication skills are... Uh, yeah, I would I would say communication skills are part of that, you know, emotional portfolio, but definitely agree. Hello, how to make the system to change our education system to prepare our kids for not past, but for the for the for the future. Uh, uh, yeah, as I as I said, you know, you, 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 I think it, it is about putting create political problem from education. Okay, it's still not political problem. That's why everybody is postponing that. So I think it is a pressure. To we need to create on political elites that it's important to to do it because once imagine if uh, there's a lot of you know foreign companies you know uh, investing in Czech Republic if they will move that you know production and and even like there are some good scientific things if they move it abroad it will not be because of the scales we will you know miss basically uh, that would be bad right and I and and I'm afraid of that. And I'm, I'm afraid also that there's not enough uh, technical education. Give you one example. Uh, in Europe, I don't know exactly Czech Republic, but I think it's a similar, more or less. In Europe, we have a STEM education means science, technology, engineering, math. From the overall cohort of those you know, students, we have 15% of, of the students technically educated. India, 30% from the different number. China, 45%, okay? 10 years ago, you would hear like, well, but those systems are not that good. But guys, today, at Indian universities in China, there are best American professors, you know. Uh, uh, there are best uh, professors uh, teaching uh, there. So there's a definitely plus. Those students, because they are not necessarily yet in the middle class, 
so they are really hungry for the for the knowledge so they learn uh really a lot you know yeah is there a way for parents to help their children school to perform better into this education what do you think uh yeah i think definitely uh, uh, and i would say i talked uh, on uh, facebook yesterday about it with the you know, in, in check i think whatever are your kids doing whatever are the interests whatever your kids should learn obviously check that's clear but they they need to be able you know to basically watch and learn uh in english english guys whoever will not know english in 10 15 years that will be a huge disadvantage because today uh look i if i compare when i was in microsoft 20 years ago i was doing a lot of like seminars you know where, where i learn and so on but since like 10 years ago i'm learning probably almost 100 percent what i'm learning i'm learning from internet on youtube you can have today best you know uh um, best uh, 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 uh people you can learn from uh, basically uh best guys right for example having tanya here on the on the call google is doing fantastic uh, it's podcast and it's also on youtube it's called authors at google so before you are buying some book today you can listen to that you know uh, guy or uh, that lady at uh, authors at google and have a you know a good view right so i think it is really how you can help your kids first of all learn english so they can you know stay connected basically in in the world and make sure they are still like uh, curious you know help them with the uh, with, with the after school activities with the sport and so on and also have a have a good uh, digital hygiene right i mean i like those devices it's all great but we should know where we are connected and we should know where we should be also uh, disconnected right uh, because all of those devices the, the issue is that our brain we have something they call in psychology novelty bias okay our brain goes after new things okay and the issue is imagine your child is like you know learning something there's a good you know she she's like she or he is like focused on learning and so on and then suddenly well somebody will call or there is some you know pop up or whatever it takes 14 minutes to get the same level of concentration it's called switching cost right because our brain unless that phone or the device will be switched off you still your brain still go after the new uh, signal because we wanted to have new like dopamine shot in in our brain so that's a that's another thing to have this you know digital hygiene if if, if you will right uh, and then then the third thing and i talk about it help your kids to understand who they are really right uh, because once we are teaching and it starts in the kindergarten we are teaching kids what is around them but we are not teaching kids necessarily what is inside them and i, I can tell you i was working in in Brno in kindergarten a couple of years ago with a group of the kids they were four years old and obviously they cannot you know fulfill any test or whatever so what i said teachers you should watch for one week those kids with if they are like playing with the leg or whatever and i what i try i took that you know because gallup they have like 10 different you know talents for small kids and i said okay if they are like futuristic which means like they are like using imagination and stuff like that they'll probably play with like lego or mercury which is the, the you know another uh, uh you know thing and what they are building and so on and funny enough then i have a i was like sitting with those kids at the at the floor and it was fascinating because they quite understood what kind of the they, they obviously didn't know what is talent or what are genes or whatever but they understood what kind of the activities are giving them you know energy what they really like yeah, right that was interesting but what was super interesting they knew what the other kids were you know doing and what the other kids like and what how other kids are different you know from me it was fascinating you know right so it, it was kind of the teamwork and i think those the, the kids are you know amazing if you watch i'm telling my athletes because they are like oh you know i'm so nervous before match or whatever I say, okay watch your child 
because they are absolutely concentrated all the time. Give you one example. I was using this example with Lego, okay? Imagine you are coming to your four years old, okay? And there is a huge construction from Lego, okay? And you are like automatically, because that's what your amygdala, amygdala would say, you are like automatically saying, hey, I would never build such huge construction. Never, ever I would build it. Because, and you never try, because your monkey, your amygdala is saying, no, 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 you would not do that, right? That child is not asking kind of, okay, because you think I didn't do it in the past. This is why I will not do it in the future. This is what, unfortunately, what the, if you are getting older, what your amygdala, your brain is doing, you're taking your situation you are today and you are comparing it if there is another, you know, situation from the past. And if that situation is missing, your amygdala, which is five times faster than 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 your you know logical brain, than than your neocortex, is saying no no no, you will not manage that. Forget it, right? Which is not true, right? Uh, because you need to try. That's why a lot of people are saying I'm not able to do it, and they even didn't try. Why the child is not thinking about what was done in the past, not thinking how the that construction will be you know finished. The child thinks about this very cubicle putting into right place a new, you know, uh, connection, new uh, uh, connection is uh, created, new synaptic uh, connection is created. And that's why that child is learning in a, in a very fast way, right? And then unfortunately, that system, when you are like six years old, that system is cutting that, right? And then because the, the kids are curious, they, they, they wanted to try different things. And then school is coming and saying, this is it, this is it, this is it, okay? And if you will ask, you know, try to ask six, seven years old child, uh, did you try to ask your teacher, can we do it differently? And usually the child would tell you that the teacher would say, no, it's what is in the book, or, you know, and will tell you exactly what to do, okay? This is it, right? And you can... You can sometimes do the things differently, obviously, right? Because what is, look, what is the key? You guys are working for some very innovative companies, I understand, and so on. What is the key for the innovation is the clarity of the brain, but it's also the curiosity. What, what the innovators are asking in a nutshell, can we do it differently? That was what Bill Gates asked, what the Google guys asked, what you know Steve Jobs asked, can we do it differently? This question is forbidden in the majority of the schools, right? I'm exaggerating a bit, right? But for the good, uh, for the good reason. What I realized after all of those years in the in the business and now in coaching, if you wanted to achieve something, you need to exaggerate a bit in your community in a good way in in your communication, right? Uh, okay, uh, Libor, hello, system change. I agree, but in, in intrapersonal talent is understanding your. Cautious, subconsciousness, at top uh, unconsciousness. What do you think uh, on the scale? Uh, yeah, well, that would be for that would be for another level. That would be for another presentation because what I'm using, I'm using basically part of the model from a psychiatrist from UK, uh, Stephen uh, Peters. Uh, he's basically saying that we have a three major part of the brains: uh, neocortex, logical part of the brain, the monkey, uh, obviously the amygdala and uh, subconsciousness and then i built kind of you know my upgraded model based on my experience both when i was very successful but when i got the uh, got a depression so that that would be probably you know another session what did you do in nursery what was your job there ah that's a, that's a interesting i was a i was a naughty guy i my my mom she was a teacher in the kindergarten, and I, I was like, I was very, I was naughty in kindergarten, you know, right? And I was naughty uh, when I was like on the secondary school, it was okay, but in the uh, uh, in the primary school again, I was naughty, and I was getting, I knew everything, whatever they were asking, I knew it because I, I was very curious. But unfortunately, what I, for example, did when I was like sitting down i look outside of the window and immediately there was a note you know hey he's not paying attention which was not the case obviously but i was like you know uh it was boring for me the the school i like you know kids a lot i mean i i like we've got a teacher in the first class and i believe mrs polachko 
And that teacher, she really helped me to understand how it all works. Imagine, six years old uh, child, and I was very fast in the math. And I, and then obviously I finished it. All other kids, they almost didn't study. And I was very naughty. And that uh, teacher, and I was very bad in drawing. And that teacher, if she would punish me like a normal teacher, she would say, no, no, now in the rest of the time you will draw. Okay. No. She gave me another, you know, work from math and I was doing another work. And then she said, I was a brilliant. She said, and Jan, if you will finish before the other kids, you will help those kids who are late, you know, how to do it and kind of coach them. Okay. And and I think she she helped me. She was a uh, it was at the you know like school uh, uh, in the village. She was like fifty five years old, but she was a very smart how to work with the kids. I can give you another example. Uh, when I was you know when I moved twenty years ago to Munich, that that team was like four times Central and Eastern, four times in the row best performing team uh, you know for Microsoft, and I was using a lot this philosophy. And my, my daughter, Christina, she was four years old. And she got a teacher from, uh, from uh, 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 Austria. Uh, Birgit Ertel was the name of the teacher. And she was a very tough with those kids. But for some reason, kids absolutely love her. And I was having a dinner with him. And I said, Birgit, how comes that those kids love you so much? And she said, and I will remember, it's burned in my brain. She said, Every child is a genius. You need to figure out where. Okay. And we started to talk, and she was doing like in, intuitively the same thing which I was doing with the adults. Then obviously we exchanged some experience. She moved to Dubai in 2005 and she built like three large uh, international schools based on that system. That's another, Anna, Anna, very good that that system. Is making us afraid of the mistakes. Absolutely. Because in business, you learn by mistakes. Bill Gates was always saying, if you don't know whether you should do it or not, just do it. You can always ask for forgiveness. That's the right approach toward the mistakes. Look, Mother Nature equipped us by two fantastic things. First is memory. The other one is imagination. In memory, we are storing everything what happened. And obviously, if something wrong is happening, right, we make some mistake or whatever, it can be like from the teachers or from the parents, okay, you made a mistake, fine, but let's learn from that mistake and let's move on, okay? So you cannot change that mistake. That's It's stored definitely in your memory. What you can change, it's your view of that situation, okay? I got like, how I go? I got Yeri Lehetska, you know, our Davis Cup tennis player. He just lost the match uh, two days ago in... Greece at some tournament, it was not, you know, happy with that. So I explained him, I said, you will not change that, that you lost in tie break. What you can change, it's your perception of that situation. Okay, I lost, but what can I learn? And that, and I think this is what we should teach the kids that, okay, you do a mistake, you learn, and let's move on. What you can do with the mistake is basically you need to accept that mistake, you learn, and you need to forgive yourself, okay? And you uh, move on. I, I absolutely agree with you, Anna. Majority of universities in Czech Republic would you agree? Uh, yeah, I I think there are. Look, the universities are a bit better, I would say, than uh, the uh, basic schools or uh, the um, uh, you know gymnasiums and and so on. But unfortunately. If the, if the basic school is not good, if the output of the basic school is not good, then it's hard, you know, to fix the rest. And what I'm hearing, I have some friends, they are teaching at the university, they are saying that basically the students coming to the universities are not getting better simply, right? to be like, you know, very, <laughs> uh, very diplomatic. The old school educational system tries to produce robots and machines, but we are men. That's uniqueness which will never let us to replace. I absolutely agree, right? We abs uh, absolutely, because look, the, the thing is that our brain, it's it's fantastic device, right? No, look, I'm computer guy, and I can tell you that no computer 
can you know replace in the full like capacity and 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 and, and full productivity uh, the brain the issue is that if we are born or we if we are like educated we are not getting user manual for the for the brain and we are not teach how to use that brain i don't think that uh, we are we are using you know like the technology we produce is fantastic but the problem is if our brains are not that you know uh, uh progressive uh, uh, right we are not able you know uh, to learn in that progressive way right i think as i said technology is there but the level i mean the in, how we improve our thinking it's not that huge as as we improve technology perfect guys we are like running heavily out of the time so thanks very much i'm it's great to see that there is a, a lot of interest in you know english i will invite i unfortunately i forget to invite people from in and imperial college there'll be even more people uh next time so let's agree that you know we will continue with some other interesting teams i will also invite some english speaking uh, guests uh mainly from you know abroad some of my friends so i wish you all the best uh you know uh, and let's stay connected all the best a lot of you know health that's what we need uh the main and see you soon again thank you